Section 5 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. The Constitution and Its Makers. Part 3. The framers of our government separated the executive from the legislative branch. They deemed both essential to freedom. The Constitution of my state of Massachusetts declares that the government it establishes is to be a government of laws and not of men, a noble principle and one worthy of fresh remembrance. With such a history, and typifying as it does the great doctrines which were embodied in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the institutions of England, it may fairly be asked that if the representative principle must be criticized, as it should be, with severity when it errs, it should also be treated with that absolute justice which is not only right in the abstract, but which is essential to the maintenance of law, order, and free government, to human progress, and to the protection of the weak, even as the fathers designed that it should be. When we blame its failures, let us not forget its services. They have broadened freedom down from precedent to precedent. They shine across those pages of history which tell the great story of the advance of liberty, and of the ever-widening humanity, which seeks to make the world better and happier for those who most need happiness and well-being. In beneficent results for the people at large, no other form of government ever attempted can compare with it for a moment. The worst feature of the compulsory initiative and referendum lies therefore in the destruction of the principle of representation. Power without responsibility is a menace to freedom and good government. Responsibility without power is inconceivable, for no man in his senses would bear such a burden. But when responsibility and power are both taken away, whether from the executive or the representatives, the result is simple in a nation. No man fit by ability and character to be a representative would accept the office under such humiliating conditions. Those who accepted it would do so for the pecuniary reward which the office carried and would sink rapidly into mere machines of record, neither knowing nor caring what they did. With a representative body thus reduced to nothingness, we are left with a people, armed only with their votes, and with an executive who has necessarily absorbed all the real powers of the state. This situation is an old story, and has always ended in the same way. It presents one of those rare cases in which the teaching of history is uniform. When the representative principle has departed, and only its ghost remains to haunt the capital, liberty has not lingered long beside its grave. The rise of the representative principle and its spread to new lands today marks the rise of popular government everywhere. Wherever it has been betrayed or cast down, the government has reverted to despotism. When representative government has perished, freedom has not long survived. Most serious most fatal indeed are the dangers threatened by the insidious and revolutionary changes which it is proposed to make in our representative system, upon which the makers of the Constitution relied as one of the great buttresses of the political fabric, which was to ensure to popular government success and stability. Yet even these changes are less ruinous to the body politic, to liberty and order, than that which proposes to subject judges to the recall, no graver question than this has ever confronted the American people. The men who framed the Constitution were much nearer to the time when there was no such thing as an independent judiciary than we are now. The bad old days, when judges did the bidding of the king, were much more vivid to them than to us. What is a commonplace to us was to them a comparatively recent and a hardly won triumph. The fathers of some of those men, the grandfathers of all, could recall Jeffreys and the bloody Assize. They knew well that there could be no real freedom, no security for personal liberty, no justice, without independent judges. It was for this reason that they established the judiciary of the United States with the tenure, which was to last during good behavior, and made them irremovable except by impeachment. The Supreme Court then created and the judiciary which followed, have, as I have already said, excited the admiration of the civilized world. The makers of the Constitution believed that there should be no power capable of deflecting a judge from the declaration of his honest belief, no threat of personal loss, 
no promise of future emolument which could be held over him in order to sway his opinion. This conviction was ingrained and born with them, as natural to them as the air they breathed, as vital as their personal honor. How could it have been otherwise? The independence of the judiciary is one of the great landmarks in the long struggle which resulted in the political and personal freedom of the English-speaking people. The battle was fought out on English soil. If you will turn to the closing scenes of Henry the Fourth, you will find there one of the noblest conceptions of the judicial office in the olden time ever expressed in literature. It was written in the days of the last Tudor, or of the first Stuart, in the time of the Star Chamber, of judges who decided at the pleasure of the king, and when Francis Bacon, the Lord Chancellor of England, took bribes or gifts. Yet, lofty as is the conception, you will see that Shakespeare regarded the judges as embodying the person, the will, and the authority of the king. We all know how the first two Stuarts used the courts to punish their enemies, and to prevent the assertion of political rights, which are now such commonplaces that the fact that they were ever questioned is forgotten. The tyranny of the courts was one of the chief causes which led to the Great Rebellion, and out of that Great Rebellion, when the third Stuart had been restored, came the Habeas Corpus Act, which has done more to protect personal liberty than any act ever passed. But the second Charles and the second James had learned nothing as to the judges. They expected them to do their bidding when the king had any interest at stake, and under the last Stuart, the courts reached a very low point, and the legal history of the time is characterized by the evil name of Jeffreys. When the lawyers went to pay their homage to William of Orange, they were headed by Sergeant Maynard, then ninety years of age. Mr. Sergeant, said the prince, you must have survived all the lawyers of your standing. Yes, sir, said the old man, and but for your highness I should have survived the laws, too. The condition of the courts was indeed one of the strongest of the many bitter grievances which wrought the revolution that placed William of Orange on the English throne. In the famous Bill of Rights there is no provision in regard to the courts, and it is not quite clear why it was admitted, although apparently it was due to an oversight. In any event, it was not forgotten. It was brought forward more than once in Parliament but William announced that he would not assent to any act making the judges independent of the crown. As his reign drew towards its close, however, he signified that although he would veto a separate act, he would accept the independence of the judiciary if provided for in the act of settlement, which was to determine the succession to the throne of England. Therefore, we find in the act of settlement the clause which declares that the judges shall hold office during good behavior, quam du se bene gesserent, and shall be removed only on the request of both houses of Parliament. It is necessary to pause a moment here, and consider briefly the provision of the Act of Settlement for the removal of judges on an address by the houses, because it has been most incorrectly used by persons ignorant probably of its history as a precedent justifying the recall. The clause was inserted not for the purpose of controlling the judges, but to protect them still further against the power of the crown by which they had hitherto been dominated. The history of the clause, since its enactment, demonstrates what its purpose was as well as the fulfillment of that purpose in practice. During the two centuries which have elapsed since William III gave his assent to the act, there has been, as far as I can learn, only one removal on address that of Sir Jonah Barrington, an Irish judge, in 1806, more than a hundred years ago. There have been several cases where removal was petitioned for, but Barrington's was, I think, the only one in which the demand was successful. The procedure employed shows that there is no resemblance whatever between the removal of a judge upon the address of the lawmaking body and the popular recall. They are utterly different, are instituted for different purposes, and the former furnishes in reality a strong argument against the latter. In all the cases of removal or attempted removal by address of Parliament, the accused judge was carefully tried before a special committee of each house. He could be heard at the bar of either house. He could, and did employ counsel, and could summon and cross-examine witnesses. 
This process is as far removed from the recall as the zenith from the nadir. For under the recall by the voters, the accused judge has no opportunity to summon or cross-examine witnesses, to appear by counsel, or to be properly heard and tried. He is obliged under the system of the popular recall to make an appeal by the usual political methods, and at the same time to withstand another candidate, while he is forced to seek a hearing from audiences ignorant of the law, and inflamed perhaps against him by passion and prejudice. He has no chance, whatever, of a fair trial. Some of our states borrowed this provision of the Act of Settlement when they formed their constitutions. My own state of Massachusetts was one of them. The power has been but rarely exercised by the legislature in the hundred and thirty years which have passed since our Constitution was adopted. But it so happened that when I was in the legislature, a case occurred, and I was a member of the Committee on the Judiciary to whom the petitions were referred. The accused judge was tried as elaborately and fairly as he could have been by any court or by the Senate if he had been impeached. He had counsel, he summoned and cross-examined witnesses, and the trial, for it was nothing less, occupied weeks. The House adopted the address, but it was defeated in the Senate. A year later, after a similar trial, the address passed both houses, and the judge was removed by the governor for misdemeanors and malfeasance in office. A mere statement of the procedure shows, at once, that the removal by address is simply a summary form of impeachment, with no relation or likeness to the recall. Removal by address is no more like the recall than impeachment is. If successful, they all result in the retirement of the judge accused, but there the resemblance ends. The makers of the Constitution did not follow the act of settlement and adopt the removal on address. They no doubt perceived its advantages, because it made possible the removal of a judge incapacitated by insanity or age, or disease, without inflicting upon him the stigma of an impeachment but they also saw that the removal by address might be used for political and personal reasons, of which one instance occurred in my own state, and they probably determined that the risk of its abuse outweighed any possible benefit which might flow from its judicious exercise. They placed their courts as far as they could on the greatest heights of justice, above the gusts of popular passion. They guarded them in every possible way. They knew that judges were human, and therefore fallible. They knew that the courts would move more slowly than popular opinion or than Congress, but they felt equally sure that they would in the end follow that public opinion which was at once settled and well considered. All this they did because all history, and especially the history and tradition of their own race, taught them that the strongest bulwark of individual freedom and of human rights was to be found ultimately in an independent court, the cornerstone of all liberty. Their ancestors had saved the judges from the crown. They would not retrace their steps and make them subject to the anger or the whim of any one else. They wished men to be free, as much from mobs as kings, from you as me. The problem which they then solved has in no wise changed. The independence of the judiciary is as vital to free institutions now as then. The system which our forefathers adopted has worked admirably, and has commanded the applause of their children and of foreign nations, who Bacon tells us are a present posterity. Now it is proposed to tear this all down, and to replace the decisions of the court with the judgment of the marketplace. If I may borrow a phrase from the brilliant speech made recently by Mr. Littleton in the House, it is intended to substitute, quote, government by tumult, for government by law." Unquote. Those who advocate this revolution in our system of government seem to think that a judge should be made responsible to the popular will, to the fleeting majority of one day, which may be a minority the next. They would make their judges servile, and servile judges are a menace to freedom, no matter to whom their servitude is due. They talk of a judge's duty to his constituents. A judge on the bench has no constituents, and represents no one. He is there to administer justice. He is there not to make laws, but to decide what the law is. He must know neither friend nor foe. He is there to declare the law, and to do justice between man and man. 
The advocates of the recall seem to believe that with subservient judges glancing timidly to right and left to learn what voters think, instead of looking steadfastly at the tables of the law, the poor will profit and the rich will suffer, that the individual will win and the corporation lose, that the powerful will be crushed and the weak will triumph, while the sword of the recall hangs over the head of the judicial Damocles. If even this were true, nothing could be more fatal. A judge must know neither rich nor poor, neither strong nor weak. He must know only law and justice. He must never listen to Bassanio's appeal, quote, to do a great right, do a little wrong, unquote. But the theory is, in reality, most lamentably false. No man fit to be a judge would, with few exceptions, take office under the recall. In the end, the bench would be filled by the weak and the unscrupulous. The weak would make decisions to curry favor and hold votes. The unscrupulous would use their brief opportunity to assure their own fortunes, and that assurance could come only from the rich and powerful, who would thus control the decisions. For the American court, we should substitute the Oriental Cadi, with the bribe-giver whispering in his ear. If a criminal happened to belong to some large and powerful organization in which interest the crime was committed, he would have little to fear from a court where a judge subject to the recall presided. We should have courts like those ruled by the Camorra in the days of the Neapolitan Bourbons, except that the subservience of the judge would be insured by fear of the recall, instead of by dread of assassination. The result would be the same, and certain criminals would become a privileged class and commit their crimes with impunity. In one of the noblest passages of his letter to the sheriffs of Bristol, Edmund Burke says, The poorest being that crawls on earth contending to save itself from injustice and oppression is an object respectable in the eyes of God and man. Without the independent judge, those words could never have been written. For before the independent judge alone could the poorest hope to contend against injustice. Judges, of course, are human, and therefore error. I know well that there have been one or two great cases where the decision of the highest court traveling beyond its province has been reversed and swept away by the overwhelming force of public opinion and the irresistible current of events. I know only too well that we suffer from the abuse of technicalities, from delays which are often a denial of justice, and that the methods of our criminal law are in many states a disgrace to civilization. But all these delays and abuses and miscarriages of justice are within the reach of Congress and legislatures, and these evils can be remedied by statute whenever public opinion demands reform. Their continued existence is our own fault. Yet when all is said, the errors of the highest courts are few, and the abuses and shortcomings to which I have referred can be cured by our own action. In the great mass of business, in the hundreds of trials which go on day by day and year by year, justice is done and the rights of all protected. We may declare with truth that in the courts, as we have known them, the poor, the weak, the helpless have found protection and sometimes their only defense. A mob might thunder at the gates, money might exert its utmost power, but there in the courtroom the judge could see only the law and justice. The safeguard of the rights and liberties of minorities and individuals, of the weak, and above all, of the unpopular, as a rule, has been found only in the court. And now it is proposed to undo all this, and to make the judges immediately dependent on the will of those upon whom they must pass judgment. If the framers of the Constitution were alive today, they would not find a single new condition to affect their faith in an independent judiciary. They would decide now, as they decided then. Are we ready to reverse their judgment and open the door to the flood of evils which will rush into the state as they always have rushed in when, in times past, the courts were controlled by an outside power? The destruction of an independent judiciary carries with it everything else, but it only illustrates sharply the general theory pursued by the makers of the Constitution. They established a democracy and they believed that a democracy would be successful. But they also believed that it could succeed solely through forms and methods which would not make it impossible for the people to carry on their own government. For this reason it was that they provided against hasty action, 
guarded against passion and excitement, gave ample room for the cooler second thought, and arranged that the popular will should be expressed through representative and deliberative assemblies, and the laws administered and interpreted through independent courts. Those who would destroy their work talk continually about trusting the people and obeying the people's will, but this is not what they seek. The statement, as they make it, is utterly misleading. That for which they really strive is to make the courts and the Congress suddenly and rapidly responsive to the will of a majority of the voters. It matters not that it may be a narrow, an ephemeral, or a fluctuating majority. To that temporary majority, which the next year may be changed to a minority, the Congress and the courts must at once respond. Legislation of the most radical, the most revolutionary character may thus be forced upon the country, not only without popular assent, but against the will of the great mass of the people. The framers of the Constitution made it in the name and for the benefit of the people of the United States, for the entire people, not for any fraction or class of the people. They did not make the Constitution for the voters of the United States. They recognized that the popular will could only be expressed by those who voted, and that the expression of the majority must in the end be final. But they restrained and made deliberate the action of the voters by the limitations placed upon the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches, so that the rights of all the people might be guarded and protected against ill-considered action on the part of those who vote. Those who now seek to alter the fundamental principles of the Constitution start with a confusion of terms and a false proposition. They talk glibly of the people, but they mean the voters, and the voters are not the people, but a small portion of the people, not more than a fifth or a sixth part, who are endowed by law with the power to express what is to be regarded as the popular will. The legal voters are the representatives and trustees of all the inhabitants of the country, of all those under twenty-one to whom the future belongs, of nearly all the women, of all resident aliens, and of all persons not qualified to vote. They are the instrument, the only practicable instrument, for reaching an expression of the popular will, but they are not the people as a whole, for whom and for whose protection the Constitution was made. It was for the protection of the people that the makers of the Constitution made provisions to assure deliberate movement and to prevent hasty, passionate, or ill-considered action. The purpose of those who would destroy the present Constitution is to remove these safeguards and for the people of the Constitution substitute, without check, hindrance, or delay, the will of the voters of the moment. They are blind to the awful peril of turning human nature loose to riot among first principles. But they do not stop even there. Under the system they propose, a small minority of the voters, who are themselves a minority of the people, are to have unlimited power to compel the passage of laws. A small minority will be able, and, as the experience of the voluntary referendum shows, will in almost every instance contrive to place laws upon the statute book, which the mass of the people really do not desire. A small minority can force the recall of a judge and drive him from the bench. The new system places the actual power in the hands of minorities, generally small, always interested and determined. Instead of government by the people and for the people, we shall have government by factions, with all the turbulence, disorder, and uncertainty that the rule of factions ever implies. Such a system is a travesty of popular government and the antipodes of true democracy. Under the same conditions of human nature, with no element of decision lacking then that we have now, the framers of the Constitution established the system under which we have flourished, and rejected that which it is now proposed to set up, and which all experience has shown to be a failure. Their system embodied in the Constitution has proved its efficacy. It has worked well, and it has been an extraordinary success. The other, burdened with the failures of centuries, has always trodden the same path, which revolves in the well-worn vicious circle from democracy to anarchy from anarchy to despotism, and then by slow and painful steps back to the high levels of an intelligent freedom and an ordered liberty. Our ancestors sought to make it as impossible as human ingenuity could devise to drag democracy down by the pretense of giving it a larger scope. 
we are asked to retrace our steps, adopt what they rejected, take up that which has failed, cast down that which has triumphed, and for government by the people substitute the rule of factions led by the eternal and unwearied champions who in the name of the people seek the promotion which they lack. Such are the questions which confront us today, amazing in their existence under a constitution with such a history as ours. The evils which it is sought to remedy are all, so far as they actually exist, curable by law. No doubt evils exist. No doubt advance, reform, progress, improvements are always needed as conditions change, but they can all be attained by law. There is no need to destroy the Constitution, to wreck the fundamental principles of democracy and of the Bill of Rights embodied in the first ten amendments, in order to attain an amelioration of conditions and to a wider and more beneficent social state when statutes can affect all and more than is demanded. It is not necessary to scuttle a noble ship in order to rid her of rats. It is not imperative to burn the strong, well-timbered house which has sheltered successive generations because there is a leak in the roof. It is only a madman who would hurl down in blackened ruin a noble palace, the work and care of centuries, because a stain easily erased may now and then be detected upon the shining whiteness of its marble walls. All these questions, all these reforms and revolutions so gloriously portrayed to us, it cannot be said too often, are very old. Their weakness is not that they are new, but that they are time-worn and outworn. The voices which are now crying so shrilly that we must destroy our constitution and abandon all our principles of government have been heard, quote, in ancient days by emperor and clown, unquote. They are as old as human discontent and human impatience, and are as ancient as the flattery which has followed sovereign authority from the days of the pharaohs to our own. There is a familiar story, which we all heard as children, of the courtiers of Newt, king of England, a mighty warrior and a wise man, not destitute evidently of humor. These courtiers told the king that the tide would not dare to come in against his command and wet his feet. So he bade them place his chair near the edge of the sea, and the main came silent, flooding in about him, and you all remember the lesson which the king read to his flatterers. Many kings have come and gone since then, and those who still remain, now for the most part walk in fetters. But the courtier is eternal and unchanged. He fawned on Pharaoh and Caesar, and from their day to our own has always been the worst enemy of those he flattered. He and his fellows contended bitterly in France for the privilege of holding the king's shirt, and when the storm broke, which they had done so much to conjure up, with few exceptions they turned like cravens and fled. New courtiers took the vacant places. They called themselves friends of the people, but their character was unaltered. They flattered the mob of the Paris streets, shrieking in the galleries of the convention, with a baseness and a falsehood surpassing even those of their predecessors who had cringed around the throne. Where there is a sovereign, there will be courtiers, and too often the sovereign has listened to the courtiers and turned his back on the loyal friends, who are ready to die for him, but would not lie to him. Too often has the sovereign forgotten that, in the words of one of the most penetrating and most brilliant of modern English essayists, quote, a gloomy truth is a better companion through life than a cheerful falsehood. Unquote. Across the centuries come those dangerous and insidious voices, and they sound as loudly now, and are as false now as ever. They are always at hand to tell the sovereign that at his feet the tide will cease to ebb and flow, that the laws of nature and economic laws alike will at his bidding turn gently and do his will. And the tides move in, and the waves rise, and the sovereign who has listened to the false and selfish voters is submerged in the waste of waters, while the courtiers have rushed back to safety, and from the heights above are already shouting, The king is dead! Long live the king! I have a deep reverence for the great men who fought the revolution and made the constitution, but I repeat that I as little think that all wisdom died with them as I do that all wisdom was born yesterday. 
when they dealt with elemental questions and fundamental principles the same yesterday today and forever in human history i follow them because they have proved their wisdom by their success i am not ready to say with dawn quote, we are scarce our father's shadow cast at noon unquote. but i am more than ready i profoundly believe that we should cherish in our heart of hearts the noble and familiar words of the wise son of surach Quote, let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us the lord hath wrought great glory by them through his great power from the beginning leaders of the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of learning meet for the people wise and eloquent in their instruction all these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times there be of them that have left a name behind them that their praises might be reported and some there be which have no memorial who are perished as though they had never been and are become as though they had never been born and their children after them but these were merciful men whose righteousness hath not been forgotten with their seed shall continually remain a good inheritance and their children are within the covenant their seed standeth fast and their children for their sakes their seed shall remain for ever, and their glory shall not be blotted out. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name liveth for evermore. The people will tell of their wisdom, and the congregation will show forth their praise. Unquote. End of section five. Section 6 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. Chapter 6 The Compulsory Initiative and Referendum and the Recall of Judges. Footnote an address delivered at princeton university march eighth nineteen twelve i have omitted from this address those portions which were merely repetitions of arguments contained in two preceding addresses in discussing a subject so momentous as the principles of government it is of great importance to determine at the outset exactly what we mean by the terms we use nothing is more dangerous when we are trying through the inquiry to arrive at direct results than to be slaves of words and phrases we all believe in liberty for instance and desire to promote it but explanatory words are needed for the liberty we mean and the only liberty worth having is in ordered freedom and not the license which knows no law the word progress has been much used of late in public discussion but mere progress is not necessarily good everything depends on the direction in which the progress is made we speak for example of the progress of a disease which is a most undesirable progress either in a human being or in a body politic progress is our aim and purpose only when it means an advance from bad to good from good to better or from better to best the word people again in connection with the constitutional changes which have been advocated for the past few years is also used in a misleading manner the people referred to in the constitution means all the people of the united states people as referred to in popular discussion by those who favor radical alterations in our constitution invariably means a majority of the voters which is a totally different thing from the people it is quite true that the voters are the channel through which we necessarily obtain an expression of the popular will but a majority of the voters are not necessarily the people and do not at all times represent the real wishes of the people the majority of those who vote on any given question may be a very narrow one it may be a very ephemeral one the majority of one year may be the minority of the next and yet you will observe that in all the practical arrangements for the compulsory initiative and referendum and for the recall of judges 
the people who can compel the initiative and in who practice carry the referendum the number who can force a recall and who in its practical operation may be able to carry it are but a small minority of the voters to start the initiative or recall in all the provisions that i have seen only a minority sometimes a very small percentage of those who voted at the last election is required when the act asked for has been adopted by the legislature and referred it appears if experience is of any value that a large proportion of the voters express no opinion either from indifference or from them not comprehending the question while the small and interested minority take pains to vote for the law and the submission of which to the voters has been compelled by their original action the result is that the laws are placed upon the statute book without any sufficient evidence that they are there i will not say by the will of the people but even by the will of the majority of the registered voters a small minority of the voters would be generally effective under these methods and of course a small minority of the voters is still a smaller minority of the people for the voters themselves are a comparatively small minority of the whole people therefore it is important to bear in mind that when it is proposed to make the government more directly a government of the people what is intended is to make the government more quickly responsive to and more absolutely under the control of the majority of the voters whether that majority is large or small also it is to be remembered that this will result in the destruction of a representative government about which i shall have something to say later on and it is a substitution of the will of a portion of the voters for the will of all the voters who are now represented by the legislative bodies i cannot express my meaning better than by quoting from a distinguished ex-president of this university footnote president wilson who says in his book on constitutional government published in nineteen o eight there are many evidences that we are losing confidence in our state legislatures and yet it is evident that it is through them that we attempt all the more intimate measures of self-government to lose faith in them is to lose faith in our very system of government and that is a very serious matter it is this loss of confidence in our legislatures that has led our people to give so much heed to the radical suggestions of change made by those who advocate the use of the initiative and the referendum in our processes of legislation the virtual abandonment of the representative principle and the attempt to put into the hands of the voters themselves the power to initiate and negative laws in order to enable them to do for themselves what they have not been able to get satisfactorily done through the representatives they have hitherto chosen to act for them in the same way when we come to the consideration of the constitution upon which i, I am about to have the honor to speak to you tonight it is important to know just what we mean by constitution a constitution in its proper significance as i understand it is a declaration of certain broad principles upon which government must be based and by which laws are to be tested the people with great deliberation agree upon these general principles submitted to them by men capable of defining and formulating them and then they are adopted by the voters after long consideration and debate they are not put beyond the possibility of change as we are told was the case with the laws of lycurgus but change or amendment of the instrument are provided for under conditions which not only make alteration difficult but which are framed to secure as nearly as possible the expression of the will of an overwhelming majority of the voters who represent the people laws which are subsequently passed by the legislative bodies called into being by the constitution are to be tested and tried by the general principles which the people have established as the foundation of all government in this country we have fallen into the bad habit in most of the states of placing in constitutions provisions which should be the subject of laws and statutes and which have no relation to general principles 
the effect of this has been extremely unfortunate for it has caused a widespread feeling that constitutions do not differ from laws that they may deal with any subject and be the receptacle of any ideas which at the moment happen to be popular this involves not only a complete misapprehension of the true purpose of the constitution but tends to destroy the sanctity which an instrument embodying the great principles of government ought always to possess i cannot put the point which i have been trying to make better than by quoting again the former distinguished president of this university in a work entitled the state in section eight hundred ninety six dealing with this habit of regarding the constitution as if it was an ordinary law mr wilson says the objections to the practice are as obvious as they are weighty general outlines of organization such as the constitution of the united states contains may be made to stand without essential alteration for long periods together but in proportion as constitutions make provision for interests whose aspects must change from time to time with changing circumstances they enter the domain of such law as must be subject to constant modification and adaptation not only must the distinctions between constitutional and ordinary law hitherto recognized and valued tend to be fatally obscured but the much desired stability of constitutional provisions must in great part be sacrificed those constitutions which contain the largest amount of extraneous matter which does not concern at all the structure or functions of government but only private or particular interests must of course however carefully drawn prove subject to most frequent change in some of our states accordingly constitutions have been as often changed as important statutes the danger is that constitution making will become with us only a cumbersome mode of legislation the constitution of the united states which mr wilson cites is a true representative of what a constitution should be it contains only general principles with provisions for the machinery necessary to carry on the government based on those general principles the first ten amendments to the constitution adopted immediately after its ratification by the required number of states are in reality a bill of rights and were placed there as the famous bill of rights was placed in the statute book of england and as the bill of rights was placed in the constitution of seventeen eighty of massachusetts a constitution which still endures with a view of protecting the rights of the individual man and of the minority against the possible tyranny of the majority lord acton in his history of freedom and one of the essays on liberty says the most certain test by which we judge whether a country is really free is the amount of security enjoyed by minorities the constitution of the united states with its first ten amendments meets that severe test more successfully i believe than any other constitution ever framed by man let me quote once more the same eminent authority as to what we accomplished in america when we framed the constitution of the united states american independence was the beginning of a new era not merely as a revival of the revolution but because no other revolution ever proceeded from so slight a cause or was ever conducted with so much moderation the european monarchy supported it the greatest statesmen in england averred that it was just it established a pure democracy but it was democracy in its highest perfection armed and vigilant less against aristocracy and monarchy than against its own weakness and excess whilst england was admired for the safeguard with which in the course of many centuries it had fortified liberty against the power of the crown america appeared still more worthy of admiration for the safeguards which in the deliberations of a single memorable year it had set up against the power of its own sovereign people it resembled no other known democracy for it respected freedom authority and law it resembled no other constitution for it was contained in half a dozen intelligible articles ancient europe opened its mind to two new ideas that revolution with very little provocation may be just and that democracy in very large dimensions may be safe 
no greater tribute than this has ever been paid to the constitution of the united states and it is all stated with the precision and the weight of a profound student of human history what he says of our constitution follows an essay upon freedom in antiquity which he sketches the rise and fall of athenian democracy the gradual departure from the laws of solon the development of legislation by direct popular vote and the removal of all limitations upon the power and action of the majority let me read to you the words in which lord acton sums up the result the philosophy that was then in the ascendant taught them that there was no law superior to that of the state the lawgiver is above the law it followed that the sovereign people had a right to do whatever was within its power and was bound by no rule of right or wrong but its own judgment of expediency on a memorable occasion the assembled athenians declared it monstrous that they should be prevented from doing whatever they chose no force that existed could restrain them and they resolved that no duty should restrain them and that they would be bound by no laws that were not of their own making in this way the emancipated people of athens became a tyrant and their government the pioneer of european freedom stands condemned with a terrible unanimity by all the wisest of the ancients they ruined their city by attempting to conduct war by debate in the market-place like the french republic they put their unsuccessful commanders to death they treated their dependencies with such injustice that they lost their maritime empire they plundered the rich until the rich conspired with the public enemy and they crowned their guilt by the martyrdom of socrates when the absolute sway of numbers had endured for near a quarter of a century nothing but bare existence was left for the state to lose and the athenians wearied and despondent confessed to the true cause of their ruin the repentance of athens came too late to save the republic but the lesson of their experience endures for all times for it teaches that government by the whole people being the government of the most numerous and most powerful class is an evil of the same nature as unmixed monarchy and requires for nearly the same reasons institutions that should protect it against itself and shall uphold the permanent reign of law against arbitrary revolutions of opinion my purpose in citing this passage from lord acton is not to remind you of the failure of athenian democracy but to call your attention what it is of the utmost importance to remember in the discussion in which we are engaged and that is that the propositions now offered for changing our system of government and our constitution are all very old legislation by direct popular vote was familiar to the athenians and you have but to read the republic and the laws of plato and the politics of aristotle to find out that there are scarcely any ideas in regard to government which were not developed and discussed by the greeks men of perhaps the highest intelligence which the world has ever seen in the same way legislation by direct popular vote coupled with a veto of the tribunes of the people was practiced in rome and the outcome is familiar to all the world the result was the despotism of the caesars the one great contribution of modern times to the science of government has been the representative system there were hesitating steps taken in that direction during the middle ages but the real development of the representative principle was effected in england and has been the glory of the english-speaking race representative government in other words stood for a great advance over the democratic systems of greece and rome and of the medieval italian cities i am not now concerned to show from history which system was the more successful i merely desire at this point to call your attention to the fact that while it might be better or worse to adopt legislation by direct vote as a substitute for representative government there can be no question whatever that to abandon representative government and take up in its place legislation by direct vote is to return from a high stage of evolution to a lower and more primitive one the life of the amoeba may be a better life and a more enviable one than that of an elephant for example but there can be no question that the amoeba is a lower stage in the scale of evolution than is the elephant
there is therefore nothing new in these propositions as to legislation by direct vote and if we examine the scheme for the recall of judges we shall see there is nothing novel in that idea either for not only has control of the courts by the sovereign authority been familiar at all stages of history but the actual practice of judicial recall was attempted in france during the revolution of eighteen forty eight the provisional government made the judges removable at pleasure and if you will take the trouble to read the manifestos issued by ledru rollin you will see how he asks the voters to let him know if any judge does not behave in accordance with their wishes so that he may remove the peccant magistrate and he further calls attention to the fact that the judges are on the bench simply to do the popular will they had also at the time of that revolution in eighteen forty eight not only this control of the judges under the provisional government but also the mandat imperatif and government workshops i will only pause long enough to say that the result of those experiments in france was the plebiscite and the third napoleon representative government and liberty faded away together and the executive became all-powerful therefore i repeat that in these propositions now made to us there is nothing new they are old propositions we are to-day asked to lay aside the great advance in government made as history shows by the representative system and return to earlier forms let us first consider the compulsory initiative and referendum in their practical working one of the great arguments used by the advocates of these changes in our constitution is that by obtaining the direct action of the voters we shall be free from the demoralizing influence and from the control of money in politics and in our legislatures in the alterations so generally made of late in our election laws in order to compel nominations to be made in popular primaries we have an opportunity to test the claim which has been advanced in favor of these reforms that we should thereby rid ourselves of the influence of money the method of choosing executive officers or members of the legislature is an alteration only in the mechanism of government although i personally think that many of these changes are and have proved to be injurious and not beneficial but none the less these primary systems afford us as i have just said an excellent opportunity of testing the question of the use of money under a system of direct popular action i have always believed theoretically that the more elections and elective offices are multiplied and the more elaborate the machinery for selecting and electing candidates the larger the field for professional politicians and for the employment of money to control election results the evidence afforded by the primary system in actual operation seems to confirm this theory the contest which arose over the seat of senator stevenson of wisconsin where the primary system is in full operation some interesting facts were brought out it appears that in nineteen o nine at the time when senator stevenson was nominated in the primaries the expenditures at the primary election by all candidates exclusive of the amounts spent by the senatorial candidates is conservatively estimated on the returns required by law at six thousand ten one hundred and seventy four dollars and if the amount expended by the senatorial candidates be added the total amount spent in those primary elections comes to eight hundred two thousand six hundred and fifty nine dollars while the total vote republican and democratic was two hundred thirty thousand two hundred ninety one in other words it cost three dollars and forty eight cents per vote to get that number of voters to the polls and i believe i am right in saying that only about one half of the republican vote of the state was actually polled in the primaries nothing in the past under the old convention system has equaled this really appalling expenditure at the primaries in a single year and in a single state from this evidence of the primaries what reason do we have to hope that money will not play an enormous part in securing the initiation the reference and the adoption of any adroitly drawn laws which the great money interest may happen to desire 
let me in closing end where i began by once more calling your attention to the purpose and spirit of the constitution of the united states the immediate object of the men who met at philadelphia in seventeen eighty seven was to provide for a union of the states in a general government and for the adjustment of the relations between the general government thus created and the several states the result in this direction was a very remarkable piece of work and has ever since commanded the admiration of the world it was the application of the principles of federation on a scale and in a manner which made it practically a new achievement in the science of government and the fundamental questions growing out of the relations of the states to the general government which occupied their discussion the first seventy years of our existence and which culminated in a civil war have been settled no one today desires to disturb those relations as they have been finally determined and no direct change in them is sought out by any of those who now urge reforms upon us the rest of the work in seventeen eighty seven was the establishment and declaration of certain fundamental principles upon which free government was to rest in the constitution itself the makers acted on the principle that the three great branches of government the legislative the executive and the judicial should be equal independent and coordinate their action carried out in practice the fundamental principle of free government as i conceive it which is expressed in the constitution of massachusetts in specific words let me quote those words to you for they are as i believe a very great and noble declaration the thirtieth article of the constitution of massachusetts says in the government of this commonwealth the legislative department shall never exercise the executive and judicial powers or either of them the executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers or either of them the judicial shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers or either of them to the end it may be a government of laws and not of men that is one and perhaps the greatest of the principles embodied by its makers in the constitution of the united states but it is only one of many in the first ten articles of amendment without which the constitution would never have been ratified by the necessary number of states there is embodied as i have said a bill of rights and in those ten amendments every line is a statement of general principle the bill of rights was intended to protect the rights of minorities and of individuals the separation of the three great departments was meant to prevent the concentration of power and all were intended to put limitations on numerical majorities the framers of the constitution did not believe that any man or any body of men could safely be entrusted with unlimited power they thought and all experience justified them in thinking that human nature could not support the temptation which unlimited power always brings they had deeply ingrained the belief of the english-speaking people that the power of the king should be strictly limited they felt that this great principle applied with equal force to ten thousand or ten million kings in other words to a popular majority of numbers they established a representative democracy and a thoroughly popular government but they thought that the right divine of kings to govern wrong was as false and dangerous a maxim when applied to many men called voters as when applied to one who happened to wear a crown the people through their delegates made the constitution they can unmake it they can create and they can destroy but the destruction or the alteration must be the work of the people and not of a temporary majority of voters it is for this reason that it is provided in the constitution that amendment and change can only come by methods which ensure so far as possible the expression of the will of a steadfast and decisive if not overwhelming majority of the people two-thirds of their representatives in congress and the senate must vote for an amendment and three-fourths of the states must adopt it the british constitution puts limitations on the power of the crown the american constitution puts limitations on the power of the majority of the voters 
these limitations are to assure the preservation of the constitution from any change which the people the whole people and not merely a majority of voters do not demand and to make it certain that there shall be no amendment except after ample consideration and by the most decisive expression of the people's will if all these checks and balances all these carefully devised safeguards which are to secure the people in their own government and to protect minorities and individuals are to be swept away then there is no need of any constitution at all general principles must then be cast to the winds and we must hold our lives our honor our liberties and our property at the will of a majority of numbers narrow perhaps fleeting uncertain here to-day and gone to-morrow from which no man can gather assurance as to his future or to his rights the most vital perhaps of all the great principles embodied in the constitution is that of securing the absolute independence of the judiciary courts are human and they have erred but bear in mind that this is a comparative world as dr johnson wisely said in political regulations good can never be complete it can only be predominant it is not a question of whether you are going to substitute for a system imperfect with some of the imperfections inherent in human nature another system absolutely perfect and final the question to be decided is whether the system which is proposed is better than the system we have the great roman jurist ulpian defined the law in a memorable phrase which was subsequently embodied in the digest of pandex of justinian let me recall it to you justitia as constans e perpetua voluntas usum quique tribuende juris praeceta sunt haec honeste vivere alterum non laidere sum cuiqua tribuere juris prudentia est divenerum atqua humanerum rerum sti atqua injustis scientia that is a great and noble conception of the law and one that it is well to bear in mind so that you may determine where it is most likely to be observed and held sacred whether it will be most surely found in the quiet of the court or among vast masses of men heated with political and party passion in the long course of the centuries during which western civilization has been developed it has been proved again and again that whatever its defects there is nothing so essential so vital to human rights and human liberty as an independent court beware how you break down that principle because courts here and there have erred hard cases make worse laws and bad laws are the breeders of anarchy and disorder we must proceed if we would proceed with safety and lasting results on general principles and if history proves anything it proves that the greatest safeguards of human rights in the long run is to be found in an independent courts which can be swayed neither by the whisper of the bribe-giver by the clamor of the mob by the command of the autocrat or by the dark threats of secret organizations end of section six Section 7 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Section 7. Footnote from a speech as presiding officer at the Republican State Convention of Massachusetts, held in Boston, October 5, 1912. End of footnote. During the last few years, other questions have arisen far more important than any tariff or currency can possibly be, because they involve nothing less than the fundamental principles of American government. 
and agitation has been in progress and is now being carried on by men of both parties whether the party division which it causes has been declared or not which aims at and if successful can lead to nothing less than a complete revolution in our system of government the scheme has now extended to the primaries which are merely a part of the machinery of government and do not in themselves involve any constitutional principle it has been seriously proposed in this state and i think in this state alone to abolish party enrollment from the party primary the proposition is a contradiction in terms the primaries were established for the purpose of purifying and improving the methods of nominating party candidates and for no other object those who belong to no party are not compelled to enter them and have no right to do so unless they intend to become members of some party for which and for which alone party primaries exist if you abolish the party enrollment and the party ticket and put all names on one ballot you turn primaries into a preliminary election but at the same time you do much more than this for you would then have an arrangement by which organized minorities belonging to any party or to none could go into the primaries and control the nominations of all parties in other words under this system not only democrats but any voters not republicans can decide the selection of the republican candidates and of course the same is true of democratic candidates who could be nominated by republican or even prohibition votes by this scheme we are to be deprived of the right of choosing our own candidates and the whole thing becomes a travesty on popular government it is idle to suppose that large bodies of men who agree on certain political principles will long submit to having candidates chosen for them whose selection they cannot themselves control my right as a citizen and the right of those who think with me to nominate our own candidates for office is a great and inalienable right which is not to be taken from us by any jugglery of the statutes if republicans are not to have the opportunity to select their own candidates and democrats are not to have the opportunity to select theirs then i say that it is the duty of every responsible political party holding well-settled principles and favoring well-defined policies to select its own candidates by its own voluntary methods and place their names upon the ballot on election day by nomination papers if the party enrollment is abolished the primaries are worthless for the purpose for which they were established and it will be the duty of all responsible parties to stay outside of them and nominate their candidates themselves and then place them on the ballot under the means provided by law i have mentioned this point because although primaries affect only the mechanism of government this attempt so to arrange them that they will become a mere vehicle for an organized minority to control all nominations brings them at once into relation with the much more profound changes affecting fundamental principles which are now urged upon us the agitation of which i have spoken and which as i have said aims at nothing less than a complete revolution in our system of government begins by this distortion of the primaries and then seeks to break down representative government and make the courts subservient to the will of a majority of the voters at any given moment the first purpose is to be accomplished by the compulsory initiative and referendum the second by the recall of judges and the reversal by a popular vote of judicial decisions i am opposed to the compulsory initiative and referendum because i am in favor of government by the people and through majorities of voters and i am opposed to and always shall resist to the utmost of my power any attempt to substitute for them government by minorities of the voters if you will study carefully the compulsory initiative and referendum you will find that it is nothing but a scheme to enable minorities to rule a small minority of the voters can initiate legislation and compel the legislator to pass laws wherever the compulsory initiative and referendum have been adopted this power of compulsory initiation has been conferred upon a small percentage of the voters remember at the outset that the voters themselves are only a small minority of the people 
the total vote at the last presidential election was in round numbers fifteen millions and the population of the united states was ninety millions that is one-sixth of the people took part in the presidential election and one-twelfth determined the result the voters are not the people they are merely a necessary instrument selected for the expression of the popular will but they are not the people they are representatives and trustees now it is proposed to give a small fraction of the voters not of the people this great power to compel the submission of laws to a popular vote and when those laws are submitted to the popular vote experience shows that they are almost invariably carried by a minority of the voters those who are interested in the passage of the law of course take pains to vote a small number who are interested in the other direction vote against it and the great mass remain indifferent in the state of ohio last september forty-two constitutional amendments were submitted to the people it was practically a revision of their fundamental law involving questions of the greatest moment fifty per cent only of the vote of ohio for governor in nineteen o eight was cast for the amendment receiving the highest number of votes and less than forty-two per cent for the amendment receiving the lowest number of votes every amendment that was adopted was carried by a third to a quarter of the voters of the state who voted for governor in nineteen o eight footnote one the details of the voting which are very instructive are given by mr c b galbraith who is secretary of the convention in an article in the new york independent for december nineteen nineteen twelve following is the vote on each of the amendments one reform in civil jury system yes three hundred forty five thousand six hundred eighty six no two hundred three thousand nine hundred fifty three two abolition of capital punishment yes two hundred fifty eight thousand seven hundred and six no three hundred and three thousand two hundred forty six three depositions by state and comment on failure of accused to testify in criminal cases yes two hundred ninety one thousand seven hundred seventeen no two hundred twenty seven thousand five hundred forty seven four suits against the state yes three hundred six thousand seven hundred sixty four no two hundred sixteen thousand six hundred thirty four five damages for wrongful death yes three hundred fifty five thousand six hundred five no one hundred ninety five thousand two hundred sixteen number six initiative and referendum yes three hundred twelve thousand five hundred ninety two no two hundred thirty one thousand three hundred and twelve seven investigations by each house of general assembly yes three hundred forty eight thousand seven hundred seventy nine no one hundred seventy five thousand three hundred thirty seven eight limiting veto power of governor yes two hundred eighty two thousand four hundred and twelve no two hundred fifty four thousand one hundred eighty six number nine mechanics and builders liens yes two hundred seventy eight thousand five hundred eighty two no two hundred forty two thousand three hundred eighty five number ten welfare of employees yes three hundred fifty three thousand five hundred eighty eight no one hundred eighty nine thousand seven hundred twenty eight number eleven workmen's compensation yes three hundred twenty one thousand five hundred fifty eight no two hundred eleven thousand seven hundred seventy two number twelve conservation of natural resources three hundred eighteen thousand one hundred ninety two no one hundred ninety one thousand eight hundred ninety three number thirteen eight hour day on public work yes three hundred thirty three thousand three hundred seven no two hundred thirty two thousand eight hundred ninety eight number fourteen removal of officials yes three hundred forty seven thousand three hundred thirty three no one hundred eighty five thousand nine hundred eighty six number fifteen 
regulating expert testimony in criminal trials yes three hundred thirty six thousand nine hundred eighty seven no one hundred eighty five thousand four hundred fifty eight number sixteen registering and warranting land titles yes three hundred forty six thousand three hundred seventy three no one hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred and seven number seventeen abolishing prison contract labor yes three hundred thirty three thousand thirty four no two hundred fifteen thousand two hundred and eight number eighteen limiting power of general assembly in extra sessions yes three hundred nineteen thousand one hundred no one hundred ninety two thousand one hundred and thirty number nineteen change in judicial system yes two hundred sixty four thousand nine hundred twenty two no two hundred forty four thousand three hundred seventy five number twenty judge of court of common pleas for each county yes three hundred one thousand eight hundred ninety one no two hundred twenty three thousand two hundred eighty seven twenty one abolition of justices of the peace in certain cities yes two hundred sixty four thousand eight hundred thirty two no two hundred fifty two thousand nine hundred thirty six twenty two contempt proceedings and injunctions yes two hundred forty thousand eight hundred ninety six no two hundred fifty seven thousand three hundred two number twenty three women's suffrage yes two hundred forty nine thousand four hundred twenty no three hundred thirty six thousand eight hundred seventy five twenty four omitting word white yes two hundred forty two thousand seven hundred thirty five no two hundred sixty five thousand six hundred ninety three twenty five use of voting machines yes two hundred forty two thousand three hundred forty two no two hundred eighty eight thousand six hundred fifty two number twenty six primary elections yes three hundred forty nine thousand eight hundred one no one hundred eighty three thousand one hundred twelve twenty seven organization of boards of education yes two hundred ninety eight thousand four hundred sixty no two hundred thirteen thousand three hundred thirty seven number twenty eight creating office of the superintendent of public instruction to replace state commissioner of common schools yes two hundred fifty six thousand six hundred and fifteen no two hundred fifty one thousand nine hundred forty six number twenty nine to extend state board limit to fifty million dollars for intercounty wagon roads yes two hundred seventy two thousand five hundred sixty four no two hundred seventy four thousand five hundred eighty two number thirty regulating insurance yes three hundred twenty one thousand three hundred eighty eight no one hundred ninety six thousand six hundred twenty eight number thirty one abolishing board of public works yes two hundred ninety six thousand six hundred thirty five no two hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred twenty nine number thirty two taxation of state and municipal bonds inheritances incomes franchises and production of minerals yes two hundred sixty nine thousand thirty nine no two hundred forty nine thousand eight hundred sixty four number thirty three regulation of corporations and sale of personal property yes three hundred thousand four hundred sixty six no two hundred and twelve thousand seven hundred and four number thirty four double liability of stockholders and inspection of private banks yes three hundred seventy seven thousand two hundred seventy two no one hundred fifty six thousand six hundred eighty eight number thirty five regulating state printing yes three hundred nineteen thousand six hundred and twelve no one hundred ninety two thousand three hundred seventy eight number thirty six eligibility of women to certain offices yes two hundred sixty one thousand eight hundred and six no two hundred eighty four thousand three hundred seventy number thirty seven civil service yes three hundred six thousand seven hundred sixty seven 
no two hundred four thousand five hundred eighty number thirty eight out of door advertising yes two hundred sixty one thousand three hundred sixty one no two hundred sixty two thousand four hundred forty number thirty nine methods of submitting amendments to the constitution yes two hundred seventy one thousand eight hundred twenty seven no two hundred forty six thousand six hundred eighty seven number forty municipal home rule yes three hundred one thousand eight hundred sixty one no two hundred fifteen thousand one hundred twenty number forty one schedule of amendments yes two hundred seventy five thousand sixty two no two hundred thirteen thousand nine hundred seventy nine for license to traffic in intoxicating liquors two hundred seventy three thousand three hundred sixty one against license to traffic in intoxicating liquors one hundred eighty eight thousand eight hundred twenty five some recent ohio election statistics are given here for purpose of comparison the vote for governor in nineteen o eight was one million one hundred twenty five thousand fifty four in nineteen ten nine hundred thirty two thousand two hundred sixty two the highest vote cast on any amendment was five hundred eighty six thousand two hundred ninety five on women's suffrage the lowest four hundred sixty two thousand one hundred eighty six was polled on the liquor license amendment a vigorous campaign was waged for both of these it will be noted however that the aggregate vote on the latter was much lower than that given for any other proposal it stood alone at the head of the second column of the ballot and many voters evidently after following down the column to number forty one thought they had reached the end of the list and did not take notice the license proposal at the head of the next column of all questions considered the initiative and referendum was most thoroughly discussed in and out of the convention it will be noted that while the majority for this prime article of the progressive faith is large it is exceeded by that given for each of the twenty-three other proposals measures accorded a high vote in the convention were not always so popular with the electors of the state the amendment receiving the highest majority passed by the convention by only a single vote more than the lowest in the entire series while numbers twenty four and thirty six which passed the convention almost unanimously were both defeated attractive titles undoubtedly help to increase the majorities in some instances amendment number one is brief following is the full text the right of trial by jury shall be inviolate except that in civil cases laws may be passed to authorize the rendering of a verdict by the concurrence of not less than three-fourths of the jury this amendment was given the title reform in civil jury system reform in these progressive times is particularly attractive it is a case in which a rose by any other name would not smell quite so sweet this initial word probably brought a few thousand votes to an amendment that would certainly have carried under a more appropriate title in this class should be included number ten welfare of employees it provides that laws may be passed fixing and regulating the hours of labor establishing a minimum wage and providing for the health comfort and safety and general welfare of employees in this instance also the title helped a proposal that would doubtless have carried with a more explicit designation it will be seen that eight of the forty-two proposals failed to receive the required majority the first of these is the abolition of capital punishment the old doctrine of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was promulgated effectively in the convention and before the people it was also urged that under existing law in ohio the jury may recommend mercy and thus prevent electrocution the issue was clearly defined and the result fairly represents the present sentiment of the state on this subject there are evidences however that the verdict is not final and that the time is not far distant when it will be reversed to the surprise of most of the careful observers of number twenty two providing for the regulation of contempt proceedings and the prohibition of injunctions in controversies involving the employment of labor was lost the principle embodied in this amendment has been advocated for years by organized labor 
women's suffrage was defeated by a decisive majority but not so large proportionally as that registered against the reform in oregon in nineteen ten on the occasion of its third submission to the electors of that state through initiative petition liquor interests were most active in opposing this amendment unfortunately the opposition to women's suffrage adversely affected number thirty six which provided for the appointment of women to certain offices in the state and its political subdivisions where interests and care of women and children are involved on the face of the returns the electors of ohio have evidently resolved thoroughly to eliminate women from participating in public affairs perhaps the greatest surprise was the result of the vote on number twenty four omitting the word white the constitution of eighteen fifty one which was adopted before the emancipation of the colored race limited the elective franchise to every white male citizen of the united states of the age of twenty-one years the word white still remains in the constitution although it was made of no effect by the adoption of the fifteenth amendment to the constitution of the united states the amendment simply sought to make the constitution of ohio harmonize in form with the national constitution a similar amendment complicated it is true with other issues was submitted in this state in eighteen sixty seven and defeated race prejudice is evidently still strong in ohio a state that in eighteen sixty one through eighteen sixty five poured forth her blood freely to blot out an invidious distinction that is still retained in her constitution the authorization of the use of voting machines was defeated largely through the strenuous opposition to it in the city of cleveland and the apprehension in rural counties that the innovation would involve needless expense perhaps the word machines had for some a sinister suggestion that increased the unfavorable vote amendment number twenty nine best known among its friends as the good roads proposal was strongly combated in the convention and the opposition was carried to the people the heaviest vote against it was polled by the farmers of the counties that already have good roads many voters in the cities and in the country were opposed to raising the bond limit of the constitution for any purpose the last in the list of defeated amendments is number thirty eight outdoor advertising this simply sought to give the general assembly authority to regulate outdoor advertising especially billboards which often mar the beauty of cities with their unsightly displays the billboard companies fought the amendment and thoroughly circularized the state against it they succeeded in defeating it by a very narrow margin the amendments that carried without exception received their large majorities in the large cities of the state the country vote was light and conservative in a number of rural counties every amendment was voted down End a footnote constitutional amendments must be submitted to the people and always have been in the states but it is monstrous that anything less than a majority of all the voters should be able to adopt a constitutional amendment we had two constitutional amendments of no great importance submitted in this state at the last election less than two-thirds not of the voters but of those who came to the polls voted on them and although there was no substantial opposition to either yet they were put into our constitution by a vote which was less than half of the votes cast for the candidates i could go on and give you case after case of a similar character and they prove beyond a possibility of doubt that the compulsory initiative and referendum is nothing in the world but a device to permit interested and organized minorities to govern the legislature necessarily represents all the people whether voted for by all the people or not and is chosen on that understanding but the minorities of voters to which we are asked to give this power to compel the submission and the adoption of laws in the exercise of that power represent nobody but themselves the system of compulsory initiative and referendum means the conversion of legislatures into mere machines of record and the destruction of representative government representative government is the one great advance in the methods of government which has been made in modern times 
its growth its development its adoption in one country after another have been coincident with the advance of political freedom so much so that it has become almost synonymous with it the first care of every autocrat every dictator of every man who has seized on power for himself alone has been to break down the representative body or reduce it to a form and a ceremony it is now proposed to abandon this great advance which has been made in modern times and return to earlier and rejected forms it is done under the utterly false cry of let the people rule it is not a scheme to let the people rule that is found in the constitution of the united states it is a scheme to enable organized minorities of voters to rule and through the devices of the law get possession of the state the other great bulwark of freedom has been the independent court until the last few years a man would almost have hesitated to have given utterance to such a truism and now it is proposed to take from the courts their independence it makes no difference to whom the court is subservient when it becomes subservient to anybody outside the courtroom whether that influence comes from the king from money or from a body of voters that court is a servile court it no longer interprets the laws but declares that to be the law which someone else wants justice from ancient times has always been figured as a beautiful woman with bandaged eyes holding with steady hand the scale in which all rights and wrongs are weighed those who now assail the courts would drag her from her high throne in the courtroom and put her on the streets to solicit support from the passions of men to which she will then become at once the victim and the toy the independent judiciary of the united states and of england too taken as a whole and allowing for all the failures and defects incident to fallible human nature has been the most potent defence and protection of the liberty of the individual man and of the rights of minorities against the oppression of majorities i cannot here to-day argue this great question in detail that would take hours instead of minutes i merely point out to you that it is now assailed and that i do not believe that representative government and judicial independence which have been the greatest achievements of our race in its battle for political freedom have suddenly become dangerous to popular government mark well that all this agitation is directed against the representative and judicial branches of the government i find in no program any attempt to limit the executive and it is logical and inevitable that this should be the case constitutional government moves too slowly to suit some people who wish to convert it to an instrument for the quick satisfaction of their own desires and aspirations which may be either beneficial or hurtful to the people at large for this reason they would substitute for it a government which consists simply of the voters and executive go back fifty years and you find an example of a government of that sort in the third napoleon with his empire based on the plebiscite abraham lincoln declared at gettysburg that the government he was trying to preserve was a government of the people for the people and by the people and that government was the government of the united states under the constitution on october twenty two eighteen sixty two governor andrew writing to daniel henshaw in regard to the conference of loyal governors recently held at altoona said in conclusion i can but regret the tendency i observe to obtrude matters mainly personal upon the attention of the people it is the great cause of democratic constitutional representative government which is now on trial it is the same constitution now as it was then except for the war amendments and if abraham lincoln and john a andrew thought that it was a government of the people which they were giving their lives to save i do not believe that any of us need be disturbed if we find ourselves in agreement with them lincoln also said in his first inaugural a majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments is the only true sovereign of a free people 
you observe that he says a majority under constitutional checks and limitations he draws the distinction between government by the people and government by a majority of the voters i have already pointed out the great gulf fixed between those two things and the proposition which now confronts us will if carried out break down government by the people which is secured by the limitations of the constitution and give us bound over and helpless to the action of a majority of the voters appearing at any given moment voters who are a minority of the people and whose majority may be fleeting temporary or accidental it was against this precise situation that the special checks and limitations which lincoln approved were devised by the convention over which washington presided let me bring home to you just what i mean by asking your attention to the first ten amendments of the constitution those amendments constitute a bill of rights they have become so much a part of the life of each one of us that we think no more of them than of the air we breathe lest we forget let me recall them to you these amendments protect every man in his religion there may be only two or three gathered together but congress can make no law to touch them they are secure in their right to worship god in their own way Within a few days, a banner has been borne through the streets of Massachusetts City, bearing the demand, No God, no Master. How do you think that proposition compares with the religious freedom guaranteed to one and all by the Constitution of the United States? To each one of you, the Bill of Rights assures freedom of speech. Into the Third and Fourth Amendments, our ancestors put the principle of Coke's great declaration, that the house of every man is to him his castle and fortress. By securing each one of us against the quartering of soldiers and against unreasonable seizures and search warrants. In Article Five, it is provided that no man shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime except by a presentment by a grand jury nor be subject to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb for the same offence nor compelled to be a witness against himself nor deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law and no man's private property shall be taken for public use without just compensation article six secures to the accused in all criminal prosecutions a speedy and public trial by jury and he must be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation he shall have the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him and to have compulsory processes for obtaining witnesses in his favor and the assistance of counsel in his defense by article seven the right of trial by jury is secured to everyone where the value in the controversy shall exceed twenty dollars article eight provides that excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted think of what those provisions mean they defend and protect each one of us in that which is dearest to us they are the guardians of human rights for every item there set down is one of the rights of men and none other could there be a greater misfortune than to have these famous clauses weakened broken mutilated or destroyed whose rights do they protect the rights of majorities on the contrary they are the protection of the individual man and of small minorities of men against the power of majorities who are to interpret those provisions and say whether the laws passed by a majority of voters infringe or not upon these great guarantees of liberty the courts the courts alone can secure us in the rights which the constitution gives us get rid of the representative government get rid of the courts and you find yourself at the mercy of any momentary majority of the voters a minority of the people usually a minority fraction of all the voters entitled to vote your life your liberty your property are left at the discretion of a majority of the voters which may be accidental fleeting temporary without any chance for that second thought or that appeal to another tribunal which were secured to each one of us by the founders of the republic the constitution is not a law it is a declaration of principles the effort now 
is to turn it into a statute to be altered by the whim or the passion of the moment the constitution guards the rights of each of us no matter how humble or how poor i say to you beware how you allow any man or any men to lay their hands upon that great instrument it has been the admiration of the world we have prospered and thriven and been an example to mankind under its beneficent provisions which created a self-limited democracy something which until that day men had thought impossible of accomplishment do not let it be torn down for if you do all the great advance and freedom which it represents will perish and we shall return to those primitive forms of government which in ancient times and in modern times as well have oscillated between anarchy and despotism which at best only brief intermissions of true and ordered liberty end of section seven